So today we're picking up with part two of our introduction to the muscular system. We talked a little bit about the neuromuscular junction before we ended with the last video. So I moved back a little bit and we're gonna pick back up with that. So looking here, just a minute. Get my pen out. You can see that you have your motor neuron axon. And so it is going to attach to this muscle here and notice how when it does attach to the muscle it's not actually going to be touching it so if you look through all of this here notice there's lots of invagination that comes through this area the sarcolemma is going to be this membrane here that i did in red then you're going to have this open space that open space that's going to go between the um, knob here that you see this motor neuron knob the space between it's called the synaptic cleft. So when a signal is sent down this motor neuron, it's going to go down each one of these axon branches into the knob of this section here. And you'll see that you have your synaptic vesicles. Inside of those synaptic vesicles, you're going to have a neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine is going to be the one that we talk about today. And so when a message is sent down the motor neuron, it's going to tell it to release the neurotransmitter that's found in these synaptic vesicles here. Once it gets released, it's then going to go out into the synaptic cleft and it's going to allow that electrical signal to go from the motor end plate across the synaptic cleft and into the actual um, sarcolemma and through the sarcolemma there. Now looking here, we looked at this before, but this is going to be a close-up view. And you can see that you have millions and millions of these receptors that are going to be found along the cell. You can see all of this invagination through here that's just simply going to increase the um, area, surface area there for the neurotransmitters to come across. All right, so moving on, what's actually happening, uh, typed out so you could see it step by step for these neuromuscular junctions. First thing that happens, that action potential arrives at that axon terminal of the motor neuron. Now that axon terminal is going to be that um, end piece that we just looked at. Next, the voltage-gated calcium channels are going to open up and that calcium is going to enter the axon terminal. That calcium entry causes some synaptic vesicles to release their contents by exocytosis, so they're pushing them out of the vesicle. Then that acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptors in the sarcolemma. Now, once the acetylcholine binds, it's going to open the ion channels that are going to allow sodium to flow in and potassium out of the muscle cell. So as one's coming in, another's going out. So sodium in, potassium out. The more potassium flows in, then sodium is flowing out. And so that's going to be referred to as depolarization. After that happens, the action potential is propagated along the sarcolemma by opening of the voltage-gated sodium channels. <clears throat> And that acetylcholine, that's what the ACH stands for, effects are going to be terminated by its enzymic breakdown in the synaptic cleft by acetylcholine esterase. So this is going to be an enzyme. It ends in ASE. Those are always enzymes. And so it's going to come in and it's actually going to break down the acetylcholine that was released into the synaptic cleft. It's then going to cause those voltage-gated um, potassium channels that were open until the interior of the sarcolemma goes back to a negative charge, and that's what we refer to as repolarization, and then the sodium-potassium pump, and then the sodium-potassium leak channels are going to be restored in ionic conditions and go back to their resting state. So they become what's known as repolarized. And so looking here, we're actually going to have our action potential coming on down. Now notice that you have the myelin sheath on each side. Where there's a myelin sheath, that's actually going to speed up this transmission of action potential or of the nerve impulse. And then you'll have an opening, so it slows down right here, gets back into the section, and will speed up. So we make it to the axon terminal. 
Once it's at the axon terminal, it's going to cause these um, calcium channels, they're going to open. The voltage gated calcium channels then are going to actually allow for the acetylcholine to go out through exocytosis. So we see it being pushed out here. Next thing you know, it's going to open up through the synaptic cleft. It comes in, it attaches its receptors to these little points here. Once it attaches, the acetylcholine attaches to those receptors. Sodium is going to come in and potassium is going to go out. Then once it is finished with that, everything will repolarize and go back to its resting terms. So you can see this as far as time and how quickly it happens in milliseconds. So first thing, the sodium channels open. And so you see that happening here. Depolarization occurs due to sodium entry. Then the sodium channels close, potassium channels open. So you see that at the peak. Repolarization occurs as it starts to come down due to the exit of potassium. And then the potassium channels are going to close. And so that happens in a very, very quick process. So steps to a muscle contraction. First thing that's going to happen, as the action potential spreads across the sarcolemma, it's going to eventually dive deep into the muscle cell through the transverse tubules. Remember, that's what we refer to as the T-tubules. The voltage-sensitive proteins in the T-tubules are going to be zippered with calcium channels in the terminal cisterna membrane. And so basically, they kind of are zippered in. Third step. When the action potential reaches the voltage-sensitive proteins, it's going to cause them to change shape. This shape change is going to open the calcium channels, which releases massive amounts of calcium, to be released in the cytosol. That's the cytoplasm. And so looking here, this is where it's occurring. It's coming down through that T-tubule and then spreading out. And so looking here, here's just simply another diagram that shows you how it goes in and out. So here you're looking at the T-tubule, and of course you have your sarcoplasm reticulum, which is going around here, and it dives deep with that T-tubule. Also, we talked about those zippered sections here, those zippered proteins. That's what you're going to see here in blue. And so they're going to react with calcium. So as the positive charge starts to flow in to the T-tubule, you'll have these proteins that are zippered here that are going to be attached with the calcium channels. They're going to cause it to change shape, which is going to allow that calcium to flood into that myofibril. And here's just another picture showing how it changes shape. And then here's another diagram that shows you how the contraction, you have that signal coming in, causes it to change shape. You have a flooding in of calcium ions. When they flood in, they're going to change that troponin, and they're going to cause it to move over so the head of that thick filament can attach to the thin filament. So basically what's happening here is step one, muscle action potential is going to be propagated. Is going to run along into that T-tubule. Calcium is going to be released from the lateral sac. Then it goes to number three. You've got that calcium binding to the troponin. Now that troponin is going to be found right here on that actin filament. That was the thin, the thin filament. And so it's going to remove the blocking action of that tropomyosin. And when it does that, the cross bridge is going to move. So you're going to have the thick filament with the myosin head that's going to move over and it's going to be able to come in and attach. And that creates a cross bridge. Then the calcium leaving the troponin restores the tropomyosin blocking the action with the calcium requisition. So then it's going to move back and so this little tropomyosin here is going to move this cover back over. That way the head cannot attach anymore, so that's going to detach. All right, so step four, calcium is going to bind, like we just said, to the troponin, and it removes the blocking action of that tropomyosin. So that tropomyosin is going to be that long strand that came across there, and 
it blocked that where the head would attach to the actin filament. That energized cocked myosin head, that's where it's pulled back and it's ready to go forward and attach, is going to attach to that actin myofilament and it forms what I showed you as a cross bridge where it attaches. When ADP and that phosphate that it broke off, so it's going to take in energy through ATP, it's going to use the energy by breaking off the third phosphate. When it does that, you end up with ADP and, a and the P for phosphate. They're going to be released. The myosin head is going to pivot and bend, changing to its bent low energy shape. This slides the actin filament towards the M line. And so after the ATP attaches to myosin, then the link between myosin and actin is going to weaken and the myosin head is going to detach. Then as ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and the phosphate, the myosin head is going to return to its pre-stroke high energy or cocked position. And so it can start all over again. And so here we have that myosin molecule, which is going to be the thick filament. You have the actin filament, which is going to be the thin filament. And so you have the tripomyosin, which is going to be the strand that covers the heads that you need. Underneath, you have the troponin, which is going to be these little circles that have the attachment head site. And so the tripomyosin is going to be moved out of the way. When it's moved out of the way, then these heads go from a cock position, come in, it'll attach, it'll then contract, pull those two fibers closer together or closer to the M line. Then it's going to release and then go back into the cocked position. And so here's another visual of what's going on. So you have those myosin heads that are going to be um, hydrolyzed with ATP and become reoriented and energized. Then coming down to step two, you're going to see how the myosin heads are going to bind to the site because the tropomyosin moved out of the way. So now it can bind to the troponin. Then you see the myosin cross bridge rotate towards the center of the sarcomere. It's called a power stroke, so it's contracting and bringing it closer to the M line. As the myosin heads bind ATP, the cross bridge is then going to attach. So more ATP comes in. When it comes in and attaches here, it's going to cause the myosin heads to release. And then that um, troponin, tropomyosin is going to go over top of the troponin again. So here is a visual. All right, so you've seen that go through. Now here's what you're looking at. You actually see on the left-hand side what's going on. The right-hand side is what it looks like underneath a microscope when you're looking at it. And so the relaxed position is going to be on top. The second picture is going to be the contraction where it's contracting. And then the third picture, it is going to be fully contracted. So those myosin heads have pulled those um, filaments together and so it's fully completely contracted there. And there you can see as tension develops and goes up and then as it releases. All right, so with a motor unit, motor neurons are going to contract and go together as a unit. Now with this motor unit, notice how it has several different axons coming down that are attaching to multiple muscle cells here. I think, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's actually attaching to 11 different muscle cells or muscle fibers right here. And so as it travels down this motor neuron, when it sends out this signal to contract, it's an all or nothing response. So once it starts, it can't stop. So it comes down, it's attached to all these different cells, and so at these different neuromuscular junctions, and so once it tells it to contract, it will contract. Now, neat little fact, 
you have to have ATP in order for these contractions to be released. If you remember looking back at the other diagrams. And so if you don't have any ATP, those muscles are going to stay contracted. And this is actually what happens in rigor mortis when somebody passes away. They're not making any more ATP. And so those muscles start to stay contracted. And that's when the body stiffens up. Now, as the body starts to decompose, then those muscle fibers and those neuromuscular junctions are broken and the muscle starts to decompose away. Okay, so muscles of the larynx, for example, are going to have two to three muscle fibers per motor unit. Remember, we just looked at that one and it had 11 on the picture. Muscles of the eyes will have 10 to 20 muscle fibers per motor unit. And then muscles of the biceps brachii and the gastrocnemius are going to have anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 muscles per motor unit. So that's muscle cells per motor unit. And so once you tell one to start contracting, then you're going to have all of those that are getting that same signal at the same time. And so looking underneath a microscope, this is what a neuromuscular junction would look like or a motor unit would look like. And then you see it, of course, attaching in there to the sarcolemma. This here is a myogram. It's going to show you the force of contractions and how it relates to the action potential. And so the action potential, this is what's coming from the brain, the signals that the brain tells it to do. And so if you get a short, brief um, action potential coming through, you'll notice that you'll have what looks like a muscle twitch. So it'll go up slightly and then come back down. However, if you send several more signals through you get what's referred to as a wave summation so it goes up with the first signal somewhat comes down just a little bit and then goes back up notice if it was just one like the twitch it would have come down right here but it did not so it just added to itself it came down a little bit at this point but then added to itself then you come on over to the unfused tetanus. Notice how it sent more signals from the brain. And so the more action potential that came in, the first one it goes up and it goes up again and up again and up again. Then if you notice with the fourth one, it's going to be a fused tetanus. This is where you're having many different action potential signals come in from the brain. And so it just goes straight up in a sharp incline and it stays contracted until it reaches the end and eventually it will start to come back down. Now with the first one we looked at, that was a twitch contraction. So that's gonna be a brief contraction of all muscle fibers in a motor un unit in response to a single action potential. So you had that single signal coming from the brain. You have a latent period, which you see at the beginning, that's gonna be there in blue. You have the contraction period, which is going to be in red, so you see it coming up. Then you're going to have the relaxation period, which starts at the climax or the peak and then comes back down. And then you have what's referred to as the refractory period, and that's going to be where it's flatlined in black. Frequency of stimulation. We have wave summation, which is going to occur at the second action potential, and it's going to trigger muscle contractions before the first contraction is finished. So remember, you've got that signal coming in from the brain, and then you receive another one before it has time to relax and go back down. So this is going to result in a stronger contraction, and it's going to be an unfused tetanus. You also have a fused tetanus, which we'll look at. So with the unfused tetanus, that's where it came down a little bit. So it goes up, comes down a little bit, goes back up, comes down just a little bit, and back up. So that's an unfused tetanus. When we looked at that fused tetanus, it kind of went across, came up, and then leveled out, and then eventually it will come back down. So muscle tone. Even when at rest, a skeletal muscle is going to exhibit some small amount of tension, and that tension is going to be referred to as tone. And so when you let your arms just kind of hang by your side, if you have good um, muscle there, you're going to notice that you still see an outline of the muscle, even though you're not flexing. And that's going to be due to weak and voluntary contractions of these motor units. So they're still contracting somewhat, and it allows your muscles to show even when you're not trying to flex them there. And so that's going to be your muscle tone. 
Isotonic versus isometric contractions. So with isotonic, tension is going to be constant while muscle length changes. So you can have what's referred to as concentric, and that's going to be like lifting a book. You have what's referred to as eccentric, and that's going to be like lowering the book. So isometric is going to be muscle contractions that don't change the length. So isotonic do change the length. Isometric don't change the length of that muscle. And so looking, we see with the concentric contraction, you're bringing it up. Eccentric contraction, you're allowing the book, you're pulling it down. And then isometric contraction, that's when you hold it steady. And so it's not going to change length of the fibers. Muscle metabolism. So you'll have problems. Muscles will store about four to six seconds worth of ATP. Remember, ATP is going to be your energy molecule. It's going to be the only energy source that can be used for contractions. There's going to be three ways that you can regenerate ATP in the muscle. First is going to be through direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. So basically you're going to take the phosphate from the creatine phosphate and hook it on to the ADP and make it ATP again. When you hook that third phosphate on, that's going to um, take in a lot of energy and it's going to create a high energy bond there. So when it's broken, it will be able to release a, a lot of energy. So the creatine kinase transfers that phosphate group from the creatine phosphate to the ADP rapidly. The amount of available energy is going to be liberated by that creatine phosphate, and it's going to be about 15 seconds worth. And so creatine phosphate is then going to be replenished during rest. The second way, you have an anaerobic glycolysis pathway. And so as ATP and creatine phosphate are going to be exhausted, more ATP is going to be generated by the breakdown of glucose either from the blood or stored in the muscle as glycogen. So that glucose that's broken down into two molecules of pyruvic acid, in intense exercise, these molecules of pyruvic acid are going to be converted to lactic acid and released into the bloodstream. Your liver can then convert that lactic acid into um, the PA molecules or into glucose which is the pyruvic acid molecules. Now, once you do this, you can bring the acidity in the blood back down through breathing hard. So you get rid of the carbon dioxide, breathe in oxygen. You can bring your blood back to a more basic or more neutral, sorry, level and get rid of some of that acid. With this type of anaerobic glycolysis, this is going to be when you feel the burn. So you're exercising, you run out of oxygen that's freely available to metabolize and create the ATP, and so your body's going to start to build up that lactic acid. So ATP is then going to be liberated quickly, but generate very little compared to the aerobic pathway. And then your body has to get rid of all the acid there. And it can do it through, like we said, through the liver, through respiration, things like that. So the amount of available energy that's liberated by aerobic pathway is going to be about 60 seconds to 120 seconds worth. And then there's a third way. You have aerobic respiration pathway, and that's during rest and moderate exercise. You have about 95% of ATP that's going to come from aerobic respiration. It is slow to make ATP molecules and requires fuel and lots of oxygen. O2 is your breathable oxygen. It's going to occur in the mitochondria. This process, you're going to release carbon dioxide, water, and then large amounts of ATP, which is your energy molecule. As exercise begins, glucose is going to provide that muscle, be provided to the muscle by glycogen. Now, glycogen is how you store glucose, kind of like plants store glucose as starch. You store it as glycogen in your liver and in your muscle. So shortly after, the blood-borne glucose and pyruvic acid form glycolysis, and then you're going to have free fatty acids that are going to be the fuels. So after about 30 minutes, the fatty acids are going to be the major energy fuels. And so you can see how these things occur. All right.
So production of ATP in skeletal muscle. So you see up top we have ATP. It's going to lose its third phosphate and become ADP. But if you take and you add the creatine phosphate, it's going to help regenerate the ATP from ADP. And then you have another energy molecule. So duration of energy provided there is going to be about 15 seconds. Or if you look down at the bottom chart, you can see where you have amino acids and proteins which are broken down. You can have fatty acids liberated from adipose cells, which is going to be your fat. You have peruvic acid from glycolysis and oxygen from hemoglobin in the blood or from the myoglobin in the muscle fibers. And it all comes together here at the mitochondria. The Krebs cycle and electron transport chain in the mitochondria are going to pump out a lot of ATP, about 30 to 32. It also pumps out heat. It gets rid of carbon dioxide as a waste product and oxygen, I'm sorry, water as a waste product. And so this is going to help to basically carry your day-to-day -day activities, um, what you're doing in class, sitting there, reading, watching um, someone talk, writing notes. This is going to provide several minutes to hours of energy for you. Exercising using different energy producing systems, you have the accretine phosphate ADP system. That would be things like weightlifting, diving, sprinting. Then you have your anaerobic systems, which will be things like tennis and soccer and the 100 meter swim. Then you have your aerobic systems, which will consist of things like marathon runs and jogging. So this diagram here shows you, shows you that if you stain muscle cells for different characteristics, you'll see that they take on different colors. So you can see the different types of muscle cells that you'll have. So we're going to have three different types of muscle cells that we're going to go over. And depending on what text you use, they sometimes have different names. So what we're going to go over is we have the slow oxidative fibers, which you will see here. We have the fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, which are going to be seen here in the medium color, and then the fast glycolytic fibers, which you're going to see in the lighter color here. Now, what exactly are these different fibers used for? So here's some examples that we can look at. So with the type one or the slow oxidative type, you have those for things such as your posture. With the posture, you're going to have about a hundred plus fibers that are going to be attached to a motor unit. They are going to um, use ATPase or ATPase activity at a low ability. The contraction speed is going to be slow. Fatigue resistance is going to be high. Myoglobin content is high. Capillary density is high. You want lots of blood coming in, so you need oxygen taken in and carbon dioxide removed. The fiber color is going to be that dark red color. And the glycolytic enzymes are going to be low. And mitochondrial content is going to be packed. So you're going to have a lot in there. Now with the type 2A, the fast oxidative, these will be for things kind of like walking. And so these are going to consist of motor units that are attaching to about two to six fibers. Now, since it's attached to fewer fibers, you're going to have more muscle control there than if it's attached, let's say, to a lot of different fibers. The more fibers, the less fine motor control that you'll have. Okay, these, the ATPase activity is going to be high. Contraction speed is going to be fast. Fatigue resistance in between is going to be intermediate. Myoglobin content is going to be high. Capillary density is going to be intermediate. These are going to be the medium color or just the red fibers that you saw there. The glycolytic enzymes are going to be intermediate. And mitochondrial content is going to be intermediate. And then coming over to the type 2B. This is the fast glycolytic. And so these are going to be things for um, activities such as sprinting. Here you're going to have two to five of those motor units. So the motor unit will attach to two to five muscle fibers. They are going to have a high ATPase activity. The contraction speed is going to be fast. Fatigue resistance, however, is going to be low. So you will tire out faster. Myoglobin content will be low. Capillary density is also going to be low, and the fiber color is going to appear to be white.
Now with the glycolytic enzymes, those are going to be high, and the mitochondrial content now is going to be sparse. So with muscle fatigue, physiological inability to contract is the way we describe muscle fatigue. Its causes can include things such as ionic imbalances. So it might be an imbalance. You might not have enough potassium or calcium or phosphates, which can interfere with the um, EC coupling. Then you have prolonged exercise damages where the sarcoplasmic reticulum interferes with the calcium that's going to be released there. You could have inadequate release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum depletion of oxygen and nutrients. You could have a buildup of lactic acid and ADP, and you could have insufficient release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Lactic acid is gonna be involved in the physiological fatigue. This is what's gonna make your muscles feel sore and tired. So a buildup of lactic acid or any type of acid actually can cause um, particles or friction. And so when those muscle fibers are moving back and forth, it creates more friction because that acid's kind of grainy in between. And so that's what's gonna create that burn. So what happens after exercise? Well, we talked about the elastic acid has to be converted over into pyruvic acid. Glyc glycogen stores have to be replaced and usually you replace those when you eat carbs so you can get your carbs from things like breads or from different types of fruits or vegetables even from fast sources if you need to replace it such as simple sugars or candies atp and creatine phosphate reserves have to be resynthesized Oxygen reserves have to be replenished, so you'll be in an oxygen debt. Lots of times you're breathing hard, and so your breathing will start to return to normal as you repay that oxygen debt. And then you repaired the damaged cells. So satellite cells that are going to be found along those muscle fibers are going to go through and aid in the process of repairing the damaged muscle fiber. And so here we can look at a, we're going to start from the top. We have the quiescent progenitor cell, or quiescent, sorry, progenitor cell. And those progenitor cells are going to come in here, and they're going to act on this injured muscle fiber. And so when they come in, they attach to it. They start to repair any type of damage. Then they'll be able to repair it to normal. And then you're ready to go about your day. So adaptations to exercise. You can increase the number of capillaries surrounding the muscle fibers by doing more exercise. Increasing the number of mitochondria because you're going to need to have more ATP. Synthesize more myoglobin. Develop better glycogen storage. And depending on the exercise, muscle cells may hypertrophy. Or get larger. So muscular dystrophy is going to be a condition where it's a group of inherited muscle destroying diseases. What happens is the muscles will enlarge due to fat and connective tissue deposits within them and then the muscle fibers will go into atrophy and then start to degenerate so people won't be able to use their muscles properly. You also have what's referred to as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or DMD. It's going to be the most common and severe type of muscular dystrophy. Um, it's going to be inherited. It's also going to be a sex linked trait, which means it's going to be found on the sex chromosomes. It has a lack of dystrophin. The victims are going to become clumsy and they fall frequent, frequently. Usually they die of respiratory failure in their 20s. And symptoms of this are going to be things such as fatigue, muscle weakness, and progressive difficulty walking. As of now, there is no known cure for muscular dystrophy. And so looking here, we talked about the dystrophin that was attaching into the sarcolemma. Okay, and then you have your actin binding site region. And what happens is they are going to lack this dystrophin, and so they won't attach and connect to each other, 
so those muscle contractions never occur or start to break down. Aging in muscle tissue, aging is always going to be a problem with any system within the body. So between the ages of 30 to 50 years of age, which isn't very far off, you're going to have about 10% of your muscle tissue being replaced by a fibrous connective tissue and by adipose tissue, which is going to be fat. Between the ages of 50 and 80 years, another 40% of our muscle tissue is going to be replaced. The consequences of this is that your muscle strength and flexibility are going to be decreased, reflexes will start to slow down, and you'll have a slow oxidative fiber number increase. And that's going to finish us up with the introduction to the muscular system. We'll pick up next time actually naming the muscles.